I've already talked about a lot of the counting and winning, but I haven't talked about how we deal with ranked preference. Um, if you're using single choice voting, you either have a majoritarian or a plurality way of, of counting and winning. If you have multiple choice, you're going to just use absolute total, right? You, uh, and you could use it as percentages of votes cast, but really it's going to, going to work out the same way. So uh, if we have uh, 10,000 voters, they each get two choices, and everybody exercises both of those choices, and they, therefore there are 20,000 votes, and I end up with 6,000 votes, and someone else ends up with 5,500 votes, and we're the top two, then we get the two seats, whatever our percentage happens to be. Uh, the tricky question is, how do we deal with ranked preference voting? Um, because when you now have a richer set of information, now we're doing more than just counting. With a single or a multiple uh, uh, bubble ballot, it's all just about counting. You just count up the number of bubbles each candidate or each party got, and you award the victory or the number of legislative seats based on that count. With ranked preference, there are multiple ways of handling that richer information. Um, and the voting theory uh, um, reading that I assigned for this uh, really goes through this quite well. And so if you have already read that, you'll kind of be ahead, and I'm only gonna mention really quickly this stuff. If you haven't read that yet, um, definitely right after this lecture, that would be the next reading to go to. It's only seven pages, it's relatively straightforward and, and, and pretty easy to follow, and goes through the, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a pretty simple way, and I think quite understandable, the complexity of handling ranked preference voting. Um, the, and I'll just go through quickly what's there so that, uh, or what the ideas are, um, so that this uh, lecture doesn't have a big hole in it. How do you deal with that data? Um, the most intuitive to a lot of people uh, method is called instant runoff. Uh, basically what you do is everybody's top vote is counted uh, and the, we get a, a ranking of those candidates. And there are, um, there's essentially two ways to do, to do the next step. Let's say we have four candidates and uh, after each of their first ballots, like the, the number of uh, times that they were put number one is counted up. And uh, one candidate has 30% of the vote, another candidate has 25% of the vote, another candidate has 20% and whatever's left over is, is what the fourth candidate has. Uh, they're, in, they're in that order based on their first, people who ranked them number one. One way to, to do it, an instant runoff, is to drop whoever's in last place and reconfigure their votes. So let's say candidate D came in fourth. Um, all of the people who voted for candidate D for number one, their second preference is now added to the total for all the rest of the people, and then totaled up, and at the end of that one, if uh, then the person in last place is dropped, and their votes, their, now their, their, their votes are redistributed from their second uh, preference. Um, and if, if, the, if the second preference is the somebody who's already been out, uh, candidate D, then their third preference gets redistributed. That's one way to do an instant runoff. And that's the, sort of the most common way. The other way is to just take the top two after the first ranking, drop everybody else and redistribute all of their votes to the top two people and decide which one of those has. In that case, it's going to be a majority. It's going to be 50% plus one unless there's a, uh, an exact tie, which, you know, we don't really have to take that into account. Um, so those are two ways of doing instant runoff. And the, gr the great thing and the appealing thing about the instant runoff and why rank preference voting is actually preferred by a lot of systems is that you don't have to get voters to come back to the polls and you get the same body of voters deciding these multiple rounds of voting. One of the things about the Georgia runoff this time is that Fewer people voted than voted in the Senate elections in November. Not by much, it was really close. Typically, because uh, so much was at stake in this election, the actual voter turnout for the January runoff was really close to the November general election. Um, typically, there's going to be a big drop off in participation in a runoff, and so that runoffs are often seen as sort of being less fair. Because let's say that the first uh, round had a million votes and the second round only has 200,000 votes, which is Sounds like a crazy level of drop-off, but it's actually a pretty common, at least in the United States, a pretty common level of drop-off for these runoff elections. Um, that means that uh, the actual election, the runoff, that decides who gets the office is really being made by a very small fraction of the intended and original electorate. So instant runoff has that 
um, uh, appeal to it. There are reasons, though, that the instant runoff are, is seen as being a bad idea because of the mathematics of it, and I'll leave that to the article to sort of explain why. So there are two other ways of doing it. One is what's called a board account, which is really just an average of the rankings. And so what we need for that is not just to list the rankings, but then to give a score. And a common way to, to be would be that uh, a candidate gets a score that's equivalent to the number of candidates who are on the ballot, for being their first preference. They get a score that's equivalent to one less for being their second preference. So if there are six candidates, I would get six points if I was a person's first choice. I would get five points if I was their second choice. I would get four points if I were the third choice. And then what you do is you average those and each candidate now gets an average score and whoever has the highest average score wins. There's no runoff. It's the rankings are used to create a score, essentially a score for each candidate rather than a vote tally. Um, so I've used the term tallying up here, but tallying doesn't always have to be a, uh, an actual count. It almost always is, but it can also be a score. Now, the third way of doing this is the, what's called the Condorcet method. Um, and uh, the, this is a way of saying, okay, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take all of the candidates and we're gonna put them in head-to-head -head matchups in all the possible permutations of head-to-head -head matchups, um, and we're going to uh, find who wins in all of the possible matchups. So if we only have three candidates, and this is in the reading, but I do want to lay this out here because it shows exactly how this works, candidates A, B, and C. We put candidate A and B together against each other, head-to-head, -head, and um, we get, we, candidate C, their votes are used to count towards A and B. So if I voted for candidate C first, but I voted for candidate B in my second position, in this head-to-head -head runoff between candidates A and B, my vote would go to candidate B. Um, my third place vote wouldn't, never goes to anybody, right? So it's my, it's my, it's my first or second. Um, so we, we have A versus B, and then we do B versus C, and then we do A versus C. Now, if A beats C and B beats C, then a and B are the top competitors, and then who wins between A and B? So let's say that A beats B, B beats C, and A beats C. Then in that situation, A wins the election, because A, uh, they, A and B won against common opponents, C, but then in head-to-head, -head, A beat B. Um, now, this reminds me, because I'm talking about head-to-head -head and common opponents, this reminds me that complex ways of deciding outcomes are actually a familiar feature of something that is very widespread and familiar to, uh, to most Americans, and that is sports playoffs and seeding and rankings. Um, right now, uh, I'm, a, I'm a football fan, and we're on the eve of Wild Card Weekend, and uh, in each conference, there are seven teams that made the playoffs out of 16 teams. How did the NFL decide which seven teams there would be and more importantly, because uh, the, the matchups between the seven teams are decided by their seeding, by their ranking from one to seven, how do they decide who the seven are and who uh, is seeded one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven? They have a multi-tiered system that starts with the most intuitively obvious, which is record, right? So if you have the best record in the conference and no one else has the same record as you, you're in the number one seed. So in the NFC, um, the Green Bay Packers are 13 and three, so they're the number one seed. No one had a record of 13 and three or better, and so they're the number one seed. Um, there are two teams that, came, that had finished with a record of 12 and four, the Seattle Seahawks, my team, go Hawks, and the New Orleans Saints. The New Orleans Saints are in the second seed, and the Seahawks are in the third seed, um, because, I, and I forget which tiebreaker it was, but the NFL has a very long list of tie-breaking procedures that start with, I think it starts with head-to-head. -head. So if the Saints and Seahawks had played each other, who won that game? They didn't. Uh, then I'm pretty sure the next one is record against common opponents. So whatever teams they both played, who has the better record against common opponents. If they still have the same record, it goes to the next uh, tiebreaker, which I believe is divisional record. If they're still tied there, it goes to strength of schedule. And it, it gets down, at, 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 at a certain point, and I believe that there are 12 tiers, um, it comes to a, a coin toss. Uh, the, the ultimately, the tiebreaker is decided by a, by a coin toss. Um, there are tiebreaking procedures for 
two-way ties and for three-way and more ties because they would be different. You obviously can't use head-to-head -head in a three-way tie because the three teams didn't play each other head-to-head. -head. So, and you can actually go, go to NFL.com if you're interested in this uh, and see an election system that used, uses ranked preference voting has to have a similar set of uh, rules and tiebreakers. And the instant runoff, the board account, and the Condorcet uh, method all do, in fact, need additional procedures beyond what I've described to you to settle difficult situations. And one of the things is the Condorcet method, as is indicated in the reading, the, there's a logical possibility. It turns out it doesn't happen very often in reality, but it actually does happen, and it's a logical possibility, is that um, there won't be a clear uh, winner, because if A beats B, and B beats C, but C beats A, which is a mathematical possibility giving rank preference voting, then there's no clear winner there. That's, there it's a, it creates a circle. And so what you would have to do in a, in a Condorcet system is have a backup to that, and your backup could be instant runoff, or your backup could be board account, or your backup could be re, you know, re-election, among the top two vote getter. You know, there's a bunch of different backups that are possible. Uh, and, then, and then if that backup didn't produce a definitive uh, result, there would have to be a backup to the backup, which is basically what the long list of tie-breaking procedures that the NFL uses for uh, its um, uh, playoff seating is. It's a backup, 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 backup all the way down. There are, there are lots and lots of them. Okay, so enough said about that. Uh, I'm hoping that even if you're confused, and at this point maybe your head's swimming a little bit, we're coming up on 45 minutes in this lecture, your head's swimming, you're like, there's a lot of stuff here, and what all? Um, it's the, the real point is this, is that there, to, to democratically, and I air quote that because, not because I think democracy is a farce, but to call something democratic, to give it that label, the, uh, there are all kinds of pr selection procedures, and we're only looking at, in this case, one type. Voting, not appointment or hiring or sortition. Within one of the four methods available, there are there's all kinds of diversity, all of which have a claim to be democratic because they result from the choice of the people. Now, part of what is difficult in democratic theory is being able to then make a claim, well, is one of these procedures more democratic? Um, part of what you need, and this is something I'm going to talk about in the next lecture, but part of what you need when you're discussing more versus less democratic is you need a conception of what are we going for, right? What kind of outcome would be desirable and we can match to see if procedure one gets us to that desire out, desirable outcome most of the time or if procedure two gets us to that desirable outcome most of the time, then one of those two is going to be the better uh, more democratic system because it gets us to our desirable outcome. <clears throat> what is the desirable outcome? Ultimately, the desirable outcome is the will of the people is exercised, but that's too abstract <coughs> to really function as a final criteria. Um, in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about what are the desirable traits of the office holders that we are seeking. So, if we're picking legislators and we want to know, well, is proportional representation better or is uh, multi-member or single-member district, part of what we need to ask ourselves is, well, what are the desirable characteristics of the people who are going to make up this legislature? And is there a procedure among the real diverse set of combinations here that would be most likely to select candidates to have that set of characteristics? That's, that's sort of the big way to go about deciding what is more or less democratic. But because we might disagree about what those characteristics are, um, then we're gonna disagree about which is more or less democratic. So democratic theory, as I've already said, and as I will continue to say throughout uh, the lectures for this class, um, there, there are no specific answers. It's not as though we can do the math and carry the one and use the advocates and say, here's the democratic procedure. It comes a lot of times down to what values, traits, characteristics, and kinds of outcomes do you want, and people are gonna differ about what they want. So for example, if what we want in our legislature is a tight linkage between uh, our legislators and a distinct set of constituents, if we want what, what is called a delegate model of representation, uh, the, these 100 people are going to act like proxies for their, uh, a, set of, a, a group of constituents, then a single member district 
is probably going to be the best one because we're going to get a we're going to get a tighter we're going to get a smaller constituency and we're going to get a tighter connection between those so so elected officials are really going to pay attention to what their constituents want if what we want is we want ideas not territories represented that's where proportional representation is seen as being the best candidate if we want political platforms if we want agendas if we want ideologies represented political viewpoints um, then what's going to happen is that uh, in a single member district system, the, because you have to get either the most votes or the majority of votes in order to win, it's going to tend to press, pre pressure uh, people into having the most broadly uh, appealing ideas, which means kind of forming vague coalition-based uh, agendas. And that's what the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are. They are big coalitions of ideas that sometimes don't fit together very neatly and at other times really don't fit together at all. Um, but uh, what we're not going to get is, for example, a party that represents an environmentalist perspective because that's too narrow. If you want to have perspectives, platforms, a, you know, a, a policy agenda represented rather than people in a territory, this system is going to work because what will happen is you will, as p political operatives, will decide that they are going to represent an idea that can get a percentage of the vote. Um, it's, uh, you know, it, surveys show that Americans would vote for a Green Party or a pro-environmental party. Somewhere between 10 and 15 percent of Americans would vote for that party and what that party would want that party to win. In a single member uh, majoritarian or plurality system, you're never going to win seats. You're going to win zero seats, even if you have broadly 10 to 15 percent of the population. So for a Green Party to win, a proportional system is necessary or the Green Party will have to broaden its appeal by bringing in other issues, social welfare issues, justice issues, uh, tax issues. Um, Health care, and then it becomes the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, um, and it's no longer the Green Party. Uh, so, if we want ideas and perspectives represented, this is going to be the thing. So, which do we want? Do we want people choosing candidates to represent them, or do we want uh, essentially trustees representing a set of ideas to go and be part of the legislature? This is where we get the this choice. Um, there are other factors that play into which whether we want multi-member or single member or at large um, that have to do with the functioning of the legislature uh, and I will, get, I will talk about those in the next lecture to a certain extent but I, I'm, I'm just going to cut it off right here and just note that that's true because what I want to do now is I want to turn after all this uh, I want to turn towards uh, executive elections. What's tricky about executive elections is that we can only pick one person and yet that person is supposed to be the will of the people. That problem, as I noted, exists in a single member district, but to a smaller extent because we're still picking a hundred of those people. And so we can, even though, for example, in a district where one person wins and only one candidate, the people who voted for someone else, they in a way don't, even though they, they cast a, a vote and they're part of that constituency, they don't really have a representative. And functionally, that representative is probably not going to pay much attention to them, even though they, you know, we might think, well, they should think about the interests and good of all of their constituents. In reality, the, the, somebody elected in a single member winner take all district is probably just going to think about the key constituents that put them over the top in each election and it's their interests. Um, that is uh, problematic, but when we have 100 or 400 seats, at, that kind of at least gets mellowed out as a problem because we get a lot of different winners. We're not gonna just get one winner. For an, an, an executive position, one winner, all of the levers of power that are associated with that position are given to one person, and that person is gonna not represent a lot of the people who live in that place, right? And in fact, given certain procedures, that person could represent, or could have been voted for by fewer than who voted for their opponents. And we've, we've actually seen that in two of the elections uh, in the last uh, 20 years, the year to, uh, election 2000 and 2016, where the person who won the most votes didn't win the procedure, the selection procedure that we have in the United States for president, which is the Electoral College, uh, which is, of course, one of the reasons why uh, people don't like the Electoral College. But the Electoral College suffers from the same problem in a different version, but the same problem that all statewide or nationwide 
offices or elections hold is that we're picking one person to represent an entire people and some big chunk of the people are not going to get any share of power at all. Um, one of the appeals of the proportional representation system for a legislature is that it gives uh, different groups a share of power that is proportional to their presence in the population. So there are really literally no losers here, except if you can't make the threshold, right? Uh, and that's one of the choices you have to make. It's like, we have 100 seats, um, you need at least 1% to get one seat. And in many PR systems, the threshold will be set higher than that at 5%, no party that gets less than 5% gets any seats and its votes are redistributed. Uh, and that's again, a form of complexity I'm not gonna, gonna delve into right now. But uh, you can get that. And in, even in a single member district-based uh, winner-take-all system like the United States has for most state legislatures and for Congress, you're gonna get not just one perspective. You're gonna get both the Democrats and the Republicans. And while that might not seem like enough perspectives, that's at least more than one. So while a, a Republican living in the district where we live, that elects Laura Blumenauer time and time again, a Democrat doesn't get their representative. They don't get a Republican to represent them specifically. They're going to get Republicans from other places who will uh, be putting forward the, uh, the views and policies that that person wants. Doesn't get from Laura Blumenauer, but could get from somebody else. Um, when you have one office, that's not going to happen, right? The losers don't get any share of power. Um, now, there is a way to mitigate that, and uh, it, is to, it is to have um, a kind of required unified slash multiple executive, which is that um, every candidate who gets a certain number of votes has to be given a position in the government. Um, and in fact, the original uh, version of the Electoral College had kind of this form, which was that the electors cast two votes, and whoever got the most votes was the president, and whoever got the second most votes was the vice president, right? And the, 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 the 12th Amendment changed that to be every elector casts two separate votes, one for president and one for vice president. So we moved from a two-winner system to a single member uh, system with two different offices, president and vice president. And of course, because of the formation of the party system and the running as a presidential and vice presidential ticket, the president and vice president are political allies. The original system gave the runner up power in the government. So uh, the first contested election the United States had in 1796 between uh, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, um, Jefferson came in second and he became the vice president. Um, and uh, that meant that he was the president of the Senate. He cast a tie-breaking vote. So uh, John Adams' political opponent with a different policy agenda and a different political viewpoint had a power that John Adams did not have, right? Um, and the idea there was that even losers ought to get some share of the power. So there is a way, even with, uh, a, with, with a nationwide uh, office, to create, to, to, to mitigate what I often call the loser problem, which is that if you don't win the election, you get nothing. Um, but the more standard way, and it created problems with the Electoral College right away, um, the more standard way is to not do that, is to give all the power to the winner. So how do you pick one office that is supposed to represent all of the different people? Now, this is one of the reasons why the Electoral College exists, is that it's a tricky proposition to create a voting system that represents the will of the people and yet is going to clearly make a lot of the voters not get their choice. Um, there are basically two major ways that you can go about deciding a nationwide executive position like this. And the two systems are called the presidential system and the parliamentary system. Um, they, though they don't always end up using that kind of terminology in the actual constitution itself. But the presidential system is that the president, or in this case the governor, is elected separately from the legislature. The parliamentary system, the president, or usually called prime minister, or we could do it here calling it governor, it doesn't matter what you call the chief executive. Um, I actually should have just called this chief executive instead of governor, uh, to be more accurate. I'm going to do that. I'm going to erase this and call this chief executive. <laughs> Uh, the chief executive, instead of being chosen by the people, 
is chosen by the legislature. That's the parliamentary system. Now, part of what goes into this, and this is, this is a segue into my next lecture, uh, which I will get to relatively quickly, hopefully, because we're coming up on an hour now, uh, and that's longer than I want these lectures to be, but um, part of the problem with both of those is that they create a kind of problem for the electoral system. And this is, in fact, what went down at the debate at the Constitutional Convention around the selection of the president. Um, there were advocates of letting Congress choose the president. And uh, the reason why is because uh, that way the elected officials, the people who represent the people, do the selecting. Uh, and that one, that creates a kind of a, bowl, a buffer between the, the unwashed masses and the, this very important position. Um, it's a multi-tier system, right? A parliamentary system is a multi-tier system. First, the legislative election is held, and then the legislators hold an, an executive election. Um, the, but that wasn't so, so popular among the delegates, even though it made sense, because they didn't want the chief executive to be beholden to the legislature, to Congress. They didn't want the chief executive to be a politician's politician. And that's what you get in a multi-tier system of that kind. You get a politician who is able to successfully campaign other politicians who themselves have campaigned the people. Um, the prime minister of, uh, of Great Britain is a politician's politician, not a people's politician. The popular vote posed a problem for a couple reasons uh, for the delegates of the Constitutional Convention. One of them was that they didn't want a demagogic leader. They didn't want whoever just got the most votes out of the American people, who was the person who could be the most charismatic. They understood that, that, that demagogy could win a national popular vote. They didn't want that either because they didn't want a completely people's politician to be the chief executive. They didn't want a politician's politician, and they didn't want a purely people's politician. Um, the innovation, and you could call it the compromise, but it really was kind of an innovation based on a couple of different systems that were used uh, in, uh, in the past, uh, prior to 1787, um, the College of the Cardinals and the Holy Roman Emperor, who were chosen by uh, specially elected bodies. That's what the Electoral College is, and actually the term Electoral College isn't in the Constitution, they just refer to electors and we call it the college, electoral college, because what the electoral electors are is they are special purpose office holders. They're elected for one purpose and one purpose only, and that is to elect the chief executive. And so, uh, you know, what that system does is it means that the person who becomes the president is not a politician's politician, because they're not being chosen by legislators. They're not also just purely a people's politician either, um, they are, and then the way it's evolved in the United States is they're the people who can win the swing voters in the large swing states. And so it's not exactly that they represent the whole uh, nation, uh, uh, you know, the best distillation of all of the people. But they, the Electoral College threads that needle between a purely populist office of the executive versus a purely politician's uh, candidate winning the chief executive position. This part of what you need to do when you select a mechanism, and there are fewer options for choosing a single a, a chief executive, um, and even if we're choosing a multiple executive, even if we're electing the um, vice president separately, and we're electing the attorney general separately, and we're electing the um, secretary of state separately, which many states do, including ours, um, it still doesn't mitigate the problem that you're giving all of a certain set of power to one person, right? Uh, the unified executive just gives all of the executive power to one person. The multiple executive divides up uh, executive power and gives it to multiple different people. But you still have that same problem. And it's trickier because you now have to say, well, really, there's no best system. There is no best system for choosing one office to represent an entire political unit like a nation or a state. Um, and so, essentially, you have to kind of go with the, what you would consider to be the lesser of the evils. And uh, just to stick to the Electoral College, that is the choice that was made by the delegates. They, they didn't necessarily love it, and we don't today in contemporary America necessarily love it, but it does avoid, imagine if Congress chose the president, right? Who would be president of the United States? It would be people like Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi. Not necessarily the kind of people we would want in charge of the executive branch. 
Um, Boris Johnson, right? <laughs> to use the, to the British example. Um, but if we use the national popular vote, right, then we just end up getting somebody who doesn't have to care about politicians at all and can just appeal to and rile up and, ra and, 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 and rally just the great unwashed masses. So the Electoral College is not perfect for sure, but neither is national popular vote and neither is parliamentary uh, uh, vote either. They all have their downsides. Um, but, uh, and again, we could also, the thing that's, that, that is crazy is that we could use this kind of system, right? And uh, what we really do have is we have a double multi-tier system for presidential election. We have a multi-tier system because there's the nominating contests that give us the two major party candidates. And then there's the Electoral College, which is we in each state go vote for our electors, and the electors then go and uh, choose uh, the president of the United States. So we have two, two different two-tier uh, systems that overlap with each other. Um, we get only a single choice. Uh, the first tier of this system, the nominating process that tr creates the major party candidates, could easily be done with other type of choices. It, can't, it has to be done with candidate uh, ballots. Uh, the, the party ballot is, is a special case, only available in this when you're voting for a legislature at large. You can't use proportional representation to choose one office. But we could, you could have, at tier number one, you could have a uh, multiple choice ballot. Imagine in 2016, with 16 Republicans running for the nomination, if people, voters could have gone and filled in three names and said, you know what, I, I, I love Donald Trump, but I also like Ted Cruz. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I like Jeb Bush, but I'll take Ted Cruz, and I would also take Margaret Rubio. So if you could fill in three, that, could, that, that set of rules would have made for a very different type of primary process. Not to say that Donald Trump wouldn't have won that process, but uh, it would have gone very differently and he would have uh, likely not won given the kind of intensity. Mo I, I think it's a safe assumption that most Trump voters wouldn't have filled in other bubbles. But a lot, like, you know, a lot of people would have been like, yeah, Ted Cruz, Marco, uh, Marco Rubio, and Jeb Bush, sure, I'm good with all those guys. Um, so just fill it out. If I get three votes, I'll just give one to each of them. And that could have ended up changing the entire dynamic of the process. So when you use a multi-tier system, which when you're choosing an executive, it actually does make a lot of sense to use a multi-tiered system. Um, now, another thing that uh, can be done is rank preference voting, and you could use different types of voting in different tiers. So for example, we could have a primary system that uses multiple choice voting and then have a general election that uses rank preference voting so that, for example, people could vote for their favorite third party candidate. People could vote for the Green Party candidate, put them first, and then put second, probably the Democrat. And you could, put, you could vote for the Libertarian Party, put that first, and then second, you could put the Republican, or you could put the Democrat, or you could put the Green there, and then you could put the Democrat third. You could use different types of ballots in different tiers. That's one of the things that multi-tier electoral systems, multi-pass electoral systems enable you to do, is to target a different type of voting scheme to different sections or different, different phases of the overall election cycle. Okay, this, this lecture has gotten long, and uh, I want to try to wrap it up. And the best way to really wrap it up is to say this, that setting up an electoral system is potentially very complex. The menu of options is diverse. There are a couple things you can't do. You can't use PR for single member districts. You can't use uh, PR for uh, uh, statewide or at uh, uh, single uh, office executive positions. But there are so many options and they can be mixed and matched in multi-tier systems. And there are ways of creating multi, you know, not just two-tier systems, but three and four-tier systems. Um, there's no reason why you couldn't have a five-tiered system to choose the President of the United States, um, except people's patience with it, right? Uh, except people's tolerance for too much, uh, uh, too many different procedures. Uh, that, the last thing to say then is that part of what goes into the construction and the maintenance and the, and the healthy functioning of an electoral system is the political culture of the people which is, what will the people put up with? Like, will people really rank? 
That takes a lot of attention. The great thing about a single choice ballot is you just fill out one ballot. It doesn't take a lot of attention. It just takes a choice, a single choice. Um, also, what do people expect in terms of their level of engagement, their level of participation? Those can be limiting factors. On the flip side, and this is something that I'm going to talk about in the next lecture, is that um, people who are used to a particular type of electoral system will tend to have a particular kind of political culture. So there's a kind of a chicken and egg problem here, like, well, what kind of electoral system can you have? It has to be adapted to the political culture, but what kind of political culture do you have? That's, that's a result of what people are used to. If we were used to proportional representation in this country, we would be used to a party uh, slate and party voting. P proportional representation scares a lot of Americans. They're like, I don't want to vote for a party. I want to vote for a name. We're a very individualist culture, and the idea of putting down a party label on my ballot instead of a person's name seems f sort of frighteningly distant. Um, but if we were used to it, our political culture wouldn't, wouldn't feel that way. Um, we're used to having single member districts. Uh, we're used to having majority rule. And so our expectation is that any other system seems weird and wrong and undemocratic. But that's only because our political culture has adapted in response to the choices that were made at the founding, uh, in the founding generation, which settled us on a particular type of system. So there is a uh, mutual relationship between electoral systems and systems of governance too, but electoral systems and the political culture of the people that is using that electoral system. And both of them have an important influence on each other and they have to be paid attention to. And we'll certainly talk about this in module three of the class when we turn to political culture, but uh, I'm definitely gonna get into how electoral systems or not selection systems, because electoral systems is only one version of a, of a selection system. There's appointment, hiring, and sortition as well. Selection systems will have a major impact on the character of the people who are the winners of, the, of those selection processes.